coming today, especially on a, on a Monday morning. Um, I would like to tell you about um, a work stream or two work streams that um, have been going on in the Applied Health and Wellbeing Partnership that's based in the Centre for Public Health here at John Moores University. Um, this team was originally um, contracted by NHS Wirral to support their um, health and wellbeing strategy. And, and as part of that, um, we, we wanted to look at the social impact that's created by um, community assets. Um, so um, today, um, I'd like to tell you a bit of a background about um, community assets. Um, and um, then go, I'll go on to tell you about um, a peer-led drug and alcohol um, project um, that I evaluated. And then Hannah will um, talk to you about the community assets um, in, in Wirral and how these have been mapped and how they've been um, evaluated for their social value. Um, so our research is based around the fact that there are health inequalities um, that are widespread across the Wirral. Um, there are large gaps in life expectancy between the more affluent west areas of the world and the more deprived north and east areas of the world. Um, and this um, is, is kind of described in the Marmot Review um, that was um, put forward and in that there are social determinants of health that um, Maureen touched upon in her presentation. Um, and we, we d um, found that there are a lot of community assets in these um, areas. So rather than looking at what gaps there are and what needs there are, it, it's quite important to focus on what's there already, what are the important parts of these um, communities and how can they be maximised and, and empowered to show what social value exists already in those communities. Um, so we decided to um, look at this, but before we before we set out a methodology, we had to um, define what we meant by community assets. Um, and as you can imagine, there are a lot of definitions of communities and there are a lot of defini definition of assets. But they kind of all broadly encompass similar aspects. Um, and that is um, the individuals and the networks within the community interacting with their environment um, and um, to improve their quality of life. Um, this um, quotation here kind of sums that up and this is the uh, working uh, um, definition that we used for, for this um, piece of work. Um, so what we aimed to do was to understand the benefits of community assets, not only for the direct beneficiaries and the people involved but also the wider social, environmental and economic benefits. Um, this was driven by the, the um, social value act that Maureen talked about. Uh, and then this act um, kind of states that most, um, most public bodies um, above a certain threshold have to consider their um, wider impacts. Um, and as researchers, we were kind of in a unique position to um, explore the methods and the tools available um, to show um, community a um, social value of community assets and these grassroots initiatives that, that are of, um, that occur um, naturally in, in the, envir in the um, environment. Um, of the methods that were available, um, we decided the SROI that Adam talked about um, provided the robustness and um, structure that we required. Um, it's a framework. It's a framework that um, assesses the social and economic and environmental impact through the perspective of the key stakeholders uh, these are the organisations and um, people that experience change um, because of a project. Um, it's a story of change um, and it's expressed as, as value recreated. Um, and monetization is um, used as a, a language, I call it the language to convey what that social value means for those stakeholders. Um, so I'd like to um, tell you about a uh, project that I evaluated called the Keys Project, um, which was a peer-led um, community um, to support people affected by drug and alcohol. Um, it was funded by NHS Wirral, um, but basically they were given um, a grant, a pot of funding, and um, a 
group of volunteers and um, people um, in recovery from drug and alcohol had to put in place a recovery community. Um, so they were responsible for delivering it um, and project management um, of this project. Um, it was quite an ambitious bi business model that they had and they had a lot of um, services and activities. Um, first um, part of it was a peer mentoring and um, peer support. Um, lots of drug and alcohol users you use um, professional led services within the um, community but they find it a bit, bit of a barrier talking to clinical professionals. So. Um, the um, drug and alcohol strategy um, recommended community-based peer-led um, services, which um, the keys filled this gap. Um, they also had lots of activities, support groups, and um, people had a chance to volunteer with the project as well, delivering their own projects, their own activities, and also they could um, join the management committee. So we used um, a comprehensive evaluation framework to explore project effectness, effectiveness and impact um, over a time of um, two years. Um, we implemented a process evaluation um, with um, meet, um, observations of their management committee meetings, um, analysis of their um, PDP forms which people fill in um, on first contact with the keys. Um, and we also interviewed members of the in, um, management committee um, members. Um, we, we looked at impact in two ways. Um, the first one was impact on the service users themselves, so those people coming down to the Keys, um, interacting with the um, activities and the volunteering and the mentors. Um, we used case study interviews and this would have been either two or three um, case study interviews over 18 months. Um, a quality of life survey which didn't really work that well. They found it a bit too long to fill in this survey so we didn't get many people um, filling it in, completing the survey. But we also used progress evaluation tools that the Keys had access to and these were things like the Outcome Star um, to track their distance travelled um, through the project. Um, we looked at the wider impacts and perceptions of the project as well through um, a carers and family and friends focus group um, open days at some of their events that they organised and um, service provider interviews as well from the professional led services. So um, the Keys um, have volunteers who take part in running the project. They have a core management committee who are volunteers and ex-drug and alcohol um, service users. They have peer mentors and people who visit the Keys to take part in the activities. Um, we found that the benefits for all these people were broadly slim similar um, and first and foremost it gave them a place to go, um, it gave them a sense of purpose and worthiness. Um, previously they would have been isolated from services and their networks um, so coming to the Keys gave them a, a daily structure to combat this, the feelings of isolation. Um, a lot of the people would have been um, estranged from their families and friends through their um, recovery um, process. Um, a lot of them lost that trust and respect with their family members. Um, so coming to the Keys gave them that confidence and made them feel a bit more happy. And they were able to get back in touch with their friends and family. Um, and through the case study interviews, we found that um, f for some of them, that was an um, quite a big outcome for them. Getting back in touch with their family, building up that trust and respect with their family and friends was, was, was just so important to them. It's part of their um, recovery capital that they need. They need those networks in place. Um, a lot of the um, people, a lot of the volunteers and the um, service users came to um, take part in training um, and education at the Keys. So it provided them a route to um, employment. They built up their CV um, and quite a lot of the people actually went on to, to find jobs um, towards the end of the, their life at the Keys, which is quite positive. And running through all of this is um, an improvement in physical and mental health. Um, 
which is um, we, we couldn't um, demonstrate that through the quality of life survey because that didn't work out but they they um, they talked about it within their case study interviews and although it's we, we tend to not to use that as a a singular outcome it's kind of a broader uh, umbrella outcome running across all the all the themes and all the outcomes. Um, th for the wider impact, um, we use the um, um, carers and family and friends focus group um, to understand the effect of the keys on on the on this group of people. Uh, and for these um, carers and families and friends, these significant others. Um, they also go through their periods of um, social isolation. Um, they kind of withdraw into themselves when they're caring for someone or know someone going th struggling through drug and alcohol um, misuse. Um, so the, the Keys and this support group helps them um, basically come out of their shell, get in touch with other people, um, understand addiction and what it means and how they can help someone go through their recovery process. Um, and they also got access to some of the training courses that the Keys held, um, so that built up their skills as well, they learnt new skills. Um, more widely, um, we found that the Keys had started to break down some of the barriers and stigma against those um, in recovery. Um, they had a few open days um, held on their premises and also they were quite instrumental in the recovery convention um, that are held in the Wirral um, and these events are quite well attended by not only people within drug and alcohol but also the public as well. Public could come down to these events and find out what's going on and it really helped to break down those barriers um, against um, people in recovery and people suffering from drug and alcohol addiction. Um, and from the professional-led um, services, we found out that um, initially they were quite sceptical about the keys. Um, they thought um, that they were kind of they were they were um, covering some of the services that they were already offering. But throughout the evaluation, we found that the keys offered more of a, a aftercare support that these professional-led um, services couldn't offer. Um, the Keys opens at weekends, they open after five o'clock when these professional lead services weren't open. So it kind of offers a wraparound care for them and these professional lead services can signpost people down to the Keys for some kind of aftercare and wraparound support. Um, as part of the evaluation we also ran um, a social return and investment of a particular scheme that the Keys were developing called Befriending Scheme. Um, this provides a volunteer, a befriender, to help someone that's struggling to attend their medical assessment appointments. Um, it's, a very, it's a barrier going to these medical assessment appointments. There's a bit of a sense of fear, so people often don't attend. They don't go to these medical assessments. Um, so we decided to run a forecast SROI. Um, which projects um, the outcomes for the next year ahead. Um, and we did this through um, focus groups, interviews and questionnaires. Um, we valued the input, so we've got a sense of um, what investment there is going into the perennial scheme. And we used the focus groups, interviews and questionnaires to determine the outcomes and also the value of their outcomes. Um, and we also calculated the proportion of the outcome that could be attributed to that project alone. Um, we found that the inputs into the befriending scheme was mainly from the keys um, and the, the volunteer befrienders themselves and um, an, an organisation called NTG Training that provided um, training for the befrienders. Um, the outputs were mainly around developing the um, befriender package that's going to be updated every three years. Um, it involves the terms of reference and confidentiality protocols. Um, they estimated that in a year they could do 189 befriending sessions per year and they also held um, quarterly training sessions. Um, the bef um, outcomes of this um, befriending um, scheme um, had quite a few um, stakeholders. If we look more closely um, at these stakeholders, you can see that they're, they're direct stakeholders, so those people who are closely involved in the project, the befrienders and the befriendees, 
but there are also a set of indirect stakeholders um, that aren't directly involved in the project, but they still um, experience a change because of their activities. Um, the befrienders, um, again, they found that they, they were able to lead a productive and um, purposeful and productive life. They um, had training and education, um, work experience um, often leading to part-time jobs and full-time jobs and um, an aspect of socialisation as well with their peers and also the people they were befriending. Um, the befriendees, um, they had reduced isolation and the confidence to seek further services um, that they were entitled to um, and better family relationships um, because of that. Um, confidence to tackle their problems they often found that they were um, they can get in back in touch with their family and friends and um, for the indirect stakeholders um, the NHS services came in as a stakeholder because um, while the befrienders had better health and well-being um, they had um, reduced their service use but also um, because they were taking better care of themselves they might have found that they had increased GP visits and although this is a negative outcome, um, we, we, we put it in into the analysis. Um, Atos Healthcare um, run the um, medical appointments and we found that they had a lot of saved um, appointments. So um, that was um, an outcome for them. And the local government um, was in as a stakeholder because the befriendees were accessing um, housing benefits um, to, to support their um, quality of life. Um, in terms of impact, um, we have to establish um, the counterfactual and um, attribution um, of any impact. So we asked the question, what would have happened anyway? Is it likely that this outcome would have happened if the keys or if the befriending scheme wasn't in place? and also who else contributed to the change. So <coughs> after we've gathered all, gathered, gathered all this ed evidence, we can calculate the SROI ratio, and that is um, dividing the total value of the um, in, um, benefits by the total value of the inputs. Um, and we did a sensitivity analysis um, on, on the um, model to find out if, if it was sensitive to any of the changes, if we'd made any assumptions in the figures. Um, we tested it through a sensitivity analysis. So I thought it was um, prudent that we put on um, a, a range of social value that this befriending scheme could um, create over the next year. And um, it was found that it had the potential to create between £4.60 and £11.91 of social value for every £1 invested. Um, Hannah is going to come up and talk to you about the community assets um, in the rural and, um, and the social value that they can create. <coughs> there we go. <laughs> Does this just clip on? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're all connected. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Um, yes, so as um, Lindsay and um, Eric mentioned, I'm speaking today on behalf of Gail Whelan. Um, so Gail undertook um, the, the, the management of this project. Um, my role is that I manage the Applied Health and Wellbeing Partnership. So I was involved in developing the context for this as a project. Um, and then sort of saw the, the oversight really of the, the work that Gail did. Um, so I'll try my best to cover everything that Gail was going to say. You'll probably be sat there thinking, oh, she didn't say this or she didn't say that. Um, we do have a copy of the report. We've got some copies um, that are hard copy that are available that we'll take down to where we'll have lunch. Um, but there are um, copies available on our website as well. Um, so the context to, um, to this as a project really was set on the basis around uh, community assets and understanding the impact of community assets and Lindsay kind of set out that context really nicely in terms of um, 
why it's important to focus on the assets and not just the needs of communities. Um, what we wanted to do in Wirral was kind of twofold really. The first thing that we wanted to do was to understand what were the community assets that existed in Wirral. Um, what kinds of things did they cover? Who did they provide services for? Um, and then the second thing that we wanted to do is to really understand what kind of an impact do these services have or community assets have? What's the value of them? Um, with that focus then on social value and, um, and social return and investments. So the first thing that we did, um, we had to define sort of what we meant by community assets. Um, anyone who's done any work around um, asset-based community development or working, um, looking at community assets will kind of uh, appreciate that there's lots of different definitions of community um, and of community assets. Um, in the, you know, some work that's been done has focused on very physical things, so what are the buildings um, that are around that are the assets. Um, our work very much kind of focused on the organisation, so on services on, that were being delivered as, as were assets. Um, and focused very much on a local level, so we wanted to look just at those community assets that were being delivered in Wirral um, by people who were delivering them um, for the Wirral communities. Um, so there was a level of kind of inclusion, exclusion um, that Gail went through that process, putting it all onto a big database, um, and we excluded private companies and national projects. Um, the way in which the um, the projects were mapped um, was kind of through a snowballing um, process. So Gail started off by um, sort of speaking to some key people um, initially within um, NHS Wirral um, to find out, you know, what, what did we know about assets that were available in communities? And then it kind of just went through a bit of a snowballing approach and Gail did quite a lot of um, research, just looking um, on the internet, going out speaking to people, going to events and things like that, um, to try and look at what were the assets that we could include in this project. Um, so we, all of the projects were put onto a database um, and we used a qualitative approach to look at then theming these assets. And I think that there were, between sort of 70 and 80 community assets that were identified in total that were put onto this database. Um, and in order to try to understand what kinds of assets there were, we used a qualitative framework. So we did some thematic analysis on the projects that were on the database. And the analysis happened as we were going through and putting the projects on so that we could look at um, all the time that we were putting new projects onto the database. How did they fit with the key themes that we had already derived? Um, and we reached a point which um, in qualitative research um, it's called saturation. So there were no new themes emerging once we got to um, probably I don't know how many um, projects were on there, but not sort of way before we got to putting the 70 on there, there was sort of all of these themes had already emerged. Um, and then what happened was that we wanted to, um, to look into these assets in a lot more detail to evaluate the social value um, and social impact of the assets. And in order to do that, we knew that we weren't going to go out there and evaluate 70 community assets. It wasn't feasible to do that. And instead, what we did was we uh, selected a represent representative sample of assets that we would then evaluate. So um, we wanted to do this to be able to generate the evidence, as I've said, around the impact and the, the value created by community assets. So when we were theming the assets before we went and did the evaluations, um, we wanted to theme on a number of different levels. One of the key things for us was to use the Public Health Outcomes Framework really as the basis to start the theming of our community assets because we were working in a public health department. Um, we wanted to be able to translate the results of our work quite easily and readily to the people who we were working with who were commissioning services um, and involved in managing commission services that were important to public health. So what we wanted to do was to be able to almost kind of speak on behalf of the assets, to be able to give them a voice to say, look, this is what we're doing. Uh, you don't know this because you might not know that we're here. Um, so we really wanted to be able to translate the value and the impact of the work that they were doing um, into public health. So we used the Public Health Outcomes Framework as one way in which we identified did the asset fall within one or more of these four um, categories. 
And then there were a number of, number of subcategories which um, were developed. And again, the assets were themed into these categories depending on how they were delivered, the kinds of um, characteristics and the aims and the objectives of each of the assets. So here you can see um, subcategories included social support, environment, education and learning, population group, health need and health behaviour change. So I mentioned that um, once all of these assets had been themed and we knew um, what the key themes of the assets were, we wanted to evaluate a representative sample of these. Um, and we selected 11 of the assets which we felt represented all of the themes that had been identified. And we used two methods to explore the impact and social value. Um, the first thing that we did was um, a qualitative case study approach, which was used on six of the 11 um, community assets. And what this did was it sort of used a social value um, sort of approach in that it was qualitative in nature. We wanted to understand that story of change um, that Adam was talking about to understand what the, the impacts and the values were. But we didn't then go to that next stage of valuing those. Um, and then for five of the assets, um, there was a full social return on investment that was undertaken with them. And I'm going to just run through some of the key findings that were found from that. So the first project um, or asset that was evaluated was called Get Into Reading. And um, this asset uh, provided weekly reading group sessions um, to vulnerable and isolated people. And... Um, for the focus of the SROI, I think there was three different groups that were sort of looked at to, to represent the, the types of people who were using these groups. And um, this evaluation found that getting to reading created um, reading communities, but it also um, sort of had the outcomes of resulting in new friendships, um, new skills. There was things such as confidence and empathy which occur occurred um, and this led to better understanding and acceptance of others and consideration of their views. And I should say as well that the data for these were collected in the same way in which Lindsay has described sort of quite nicely that process around qualitative and quantitative methods. So I'm not going to go into all of that for, for this. Um, and it showed that for every £1 invested, um, £6.47 of social value was um, sort of gained. The second um, asset that was evaluated using an SROI was called Life Expectancy Wirral and this was a faith-led initiative um, that aimed to bring communities from affluent and from more deprived um, areas together. Um, and again, this was found to create lots of um, key social outcomes such as friendships, um, reduction in isolation, um, increased inclusion, and there was also things around mental health and well-being uh, that came out of this and people's um, feeling uh, sort of more confident and, um, and having improved self-esteem. And you can see that the, um, the social return on investment was £5.53 for this one. Um, the third um, evaluation um, of the asset was the Ferries Family Groups um, and this was a support network that was based um, in Rock Ferry and the other ferry areas of Wirral um, which um, aimed to support children and parents to kind of have a, a really good family relationship and to try and improve and enhance family relationships. Um, and the outcomes of this um, showed that mental health and wellbeing had improved, um, Parents were then able to make positive lifestyle changes and decisions to improve um, quality of life. And this also had the outcome of helping families to feel included within their community. So again, it had that impact around social isolation um, and um, improving issues around sort of loneliness and things like that. Um, Tyco Drumming for Health was one of the other um, assets that was evaluated and this was um, weekly drumming sessions that were offered. Um, it was started by two elderly men who had an interest in drumming and Gail had some fun days going out and sort of visiting them and spending time travelling around in their little van and going to different places um, to find out what it was that they did. Um, and this project was delivered in lots of different areas um, and the evaluation showed that um, drumming led to an increase. Really kind of a key, key finding was around socialisation um, and social inclusion. Um, and disabled adults reported that they felt more included in the community um, and that the drumming was seen to be a form of sort of physical activity as well as being an educational process as well. And you can see um, the, the social return investment ratio there was £8.58. 
And the last um, community asset that was evaluated using SROI was called Stick and Step. And this was a charity which offered support and therapies for families of children with, behave with cerebral palsy. And um, the outcomes that came from this piece of work found that um, new skills were really important in terms of an outcome for this project. Um, there were consequences which led to greater feelings of independence. Um, a lot of the people who were using Stick and Step reported that they were pain free um, for the rest of the day, which is such a key important thing. Um, and also increases in mobility, people were able to do more, um, young people were saying that they weren't as reliant on their parents. So there's some really kind of really key outcomes that are coming from, um, from us doing this piece of work with this organisation. And again, you can see that the social return on investment here is £4.89. Um, one of the key things that um, Adam really highlighted um, was around, you know, it's not just about the number, it's about the story behind the number. Um, and I think that one of the key things that we wanted to do was to really sort of look at what the social return on investment would be, but also to understand what the story behind that was. Um, when we had the findings of the um, 11 evaluations that we had done, we looked at what the key things that were coming out of all of them were. So these 11 community assets all had different focus, they all had different aims, different objectives, um, and yet they, they all had a uh, positive impact on individuals and their community, but they had three key themes which emerged from all of them, um, and these related to social elements, new skills, and improved health and well-being. Um, the social um, through all of these assets, it really demonstrated that meeting new people were really key things, um, that there was that element of friendship, social inclusion that was a really kind of important gain um, and linked in with elements around confidence and self-esteem. Um, in terms of new skills, again, through the evaluations demonstrated that it was really important. Um, outcome of an asset was this development of new skills, um, empowering people, um, improving their confidence again, self-esteem and self-worth. Um, and motivation was also a really important element um, that came out from the evaluations that we did. And then finally, mental health and wellbeing was a really key factor. Um, so, you know, as a kind of uh, developmental process from the social interaction, um, people were starting to um, experience health and well-being gains um, and there was sort of subsequent impacts that that then had on things like um, medication and GP appointments. And even though um, these, these three themes came out of the 11 assets that we evaluated and because those 11 assets were re representative of all of the community assets in Wirral, we could be quite confident in suggesting and purporting that these three key, key themes would be um, evident in other community assets that we hadn't necessarily evaluated through this project. And just really briefly to finish, um, one of the things that um, I know is really important around this is sort of, well, what, what difference does that make? What's happened as a result of the work that we've done? Um, what we've done is identify the, the kind of the key outcomes of community assets and how important they are and kind of brought that to the fore of um, commissioners, particularly within the field of public health. Um, and that's really important, but it's also had an impact on those projects themselves that we um, we went in and evaluated. So we provided an individual SROI or social value report for each of the projects. They could then use that to develop their own um, delivery for their, for their own service. So for example, um, Tyco Drumming, they expanded, um, they uh, delivered more sessions. And I think it was Stick and Step um, who read our report and that's how they found out about Tyco Drumming and they have now got Tyco Drumming involved in helping to support them in their, uh, their work. Um, in terms of sustainability, that's obviously one of the really key things around um, services and service delivery. Um, the report that we did was used by the Keys, um, 
they use that as evidence to help them to receive further funding, um, to continue and develop a new contract. Um, Tyco Drumming have um, used the report as evidence to get funding to employ project manager. Um, similarly, Stick and Step were able to um, obtain funding after they were um, had the evaluation report that developed the social impact. Um, and Lifestyle Expectancy Wirral emb embedded the recommendations that we had developed which helped them to change and expand their work. So for all of the work that we did, we also gave them recommendations um, which were based on some of the process side of things. Um, and one of the key things that we've talked about a lot this morning and that Maureen talked about um, and that you've sort of had discussion around here is around that monitoring and evaluation side of things. Um, so where we could do, we would work with the assets to provide recommendations of how they could be capturing um, outputs and outcomes that they could then use to help them to monitor and understand their social value. Um, so for example, the keys embedded um, when web switches to monitor well-being um, and stick and step redesign their monitoring system to collect relevant and accurate data. And one of the, the kind of the key things I think to say is that um, it is quite a daunting prospect to expect um, services, particularly third sector, um, for example, um, to be able to collect information and to know how to analyse that information to be able to demonstrate social value. But one of the key things to remember is that if that information isn't being collected in the first place, then you can't do any analysis to look at what the outcomes might be. So a lot of the work that we do is working with organisations um, to be able to provide advice and support to look at what they can embed um, so that at least they know that they are collecting the right information um, and to use it as a bit of a kind of a step by step approach in terms of putting things in place, collect the information and then decide what to do with it and to look at what appropriate information they're collecting as well. So this was one of the outcomes of the work. Um, I've put Gail's, well Gail has put her her contact details on there. Gail's now working um, <coughs> for the Institute of Cultural Capital using the work that we've done in Wirral and the framework that we've developed um, to capture and map assets and to evaluate them. Um, she's now transferred that to um, looking at mapping uh, assets in Liverpool that are related to kind of cultural um, assets. Um, so she's kind of <coughs> carrying on that work and then um, Lindsay's email address is there if you have any questions or any want any more information.